Today we've come to the town of Pennycook, nestling at the foot of the Pentland Hills near Edinburgh. We're here for Bex to visit her parents, and I thought while she was doing that, I would go out and see some of the local sites. Unfortunately, I was told in Pennycook there was nothing to see. That can't be true, can it? Whilst Bex is doing her good to daughter stuff, we're going to go and explore an Iron Age hill fort. Admittedly, this isn't exactly in Pennycook, but it's not far away. So let's head for the hills and have a wee walk round Castle Law. So we, M over there, and me are in the Pentland Regional Park. And because we're in the Pentland Hills, you do get quite a good view looking south that's heading down towards the borders. And as always, De Niro is leading the way in spite of the fact that he's got no idea where we're going. There's a man over there in shorts. He is a brave and hardy soul. So there you are, right in front of you is the hill fort and the earth house. I told you it was really exciting. That may look like a bit of hell, but it's not. It is actually a fort and an earth house. So there's the underground bit there, which was a storage cellar, sort of subterranean storage cellar. And this is where the fort was. So two and a half thousand years ago, this would have been the sort of seat of a bustling wee community. Probably even less exciting than, uh, than we were expecting. So I'm going to put the Nero back down into Daisy, and then we'll go and have a look at the underground storage bit. those things that you can see over there, those two sort of constructions, that is uh, the firing ranges. This is an army firing range where they come and do training for all the all the jobs that they get sent to all over the world. And here is the original enemy of the greyhound. It's one of those gates that you've got to bend in the middle to get through. Sometimes the greyhounds curl up into little balls and other times they think, nope, I am not going through there. It is uh, far too complicated. Today is a day when I think it's probably, no, no, this way. You can't avoid it. Come on, De Niro. De Niro, come on. Right, and then in there, come on. And then bend, 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 bend. Yay! Well done. It's not a very big car park. I do hope that I've not parked Daisy too far back and uh, end up getting stuck. Oops, that would be a bit of a, a bit of a bad idea today, I think. Right, so let's go and have a look at the underground thing. As long as nobody is inside it and jumps out and goes boo. If you go down to the suter end today, you're going to probably get muddy feet. Dee 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 Oh, lovely. Look, isn't that amazing? That's all genuine uh, concrete. It's been quite extensively restored, I think you'll find. It's very <laughs> extensively restored. Not much of it is original, but it does go for quite a long way. It's uh, uh, very wet. Yeah. Anyway, this is the inside of the outside of the hill. Apparently, when this was excavated and, for want of a better word, restored back in the 1930s, they found Roman pottery and all sorts of stuff. So this, again, was somewhere where the Picts and the Romans were meeting and trading and uh, generally getting along. Ow! I really wish I had a pound for every time I've smacked my head off something. That's the problem with it being so far from the ground. Another thing that is admittedly not quite in Pennycook is Old Pennycook House, which is the ruins of an old stately home, which is quite amazing. It was burnt down in the late 1800s and they couldn't afford to get it fixed because of some issue with the insurance. So the family moved into the stables and the house was left to go to be a very picturesque and very atmospheric ruin. It's also set in a massive park, which used to be some rich man's garden, and in that park there's this tower, which we're going to go and have a wee look at now. This is a bit muddy and we're going to go up here and look at this tower thing and I don't know what that is, but let's go and see if we can find out. It's quite imposing when you get close up to it. I have no idea what it is. Hopefully this is a sign that says, it, well it does, it says Knight's Law Tower. This tower was built for three purposes. It was built to have a nice view, it was built to be part of a nice view, and it's also a working dovecot, because the guy that actually originally designed this place believed that beauty and form and function were all combined. So it looks pretty, and pigeons nest in it for eggs and meat and stuff. Goodbye for now, Knight's Law Tower, looking really nice in the sunshine. We're now going to head down and have a look at the big house, or what's left of it. 
and I'm taking the direct route, but I don't think this is the proper path. Ah, that looks much more like an actual road there. <laughs> this is a bit of a scary descent. I was going to do a brooding and magnificent with the sun behind it thing about the house and then that cyclist went in front of me. So there's a cyclist's bottom and behind the cyclist there's a house. This really is quite a nice park. It must have been such an impressive sight when it was a house. Well, it's not a bad sight now. It's still quite impressive, but uh, it must have been quite sad for the family when it burnt out and they couldn't afford to fix it. So now they live over there. But then the stables here are more impressive than a lot of private houses that you go and look at. That is uh, not a bad building either. This is an old fountain, I think, and there's quite an interesting little chap up there on the top. Hey, what you can have if you've got the money. There's uh, the fountain, the stable block and the massive house which looks even more impressive from this side I think. This would have been the back I'm guessing. The other side's got the front door on it so uh, yeah definitely the back. They tend not to put front doors on the backs of buildings. I'll shut up now I'm just gibbering. Last time I was here you could get in. It's not very gettinable today. Let's take another walk around the front and see if it is open or closed or accessible or what. Uh, and around the back up there, there's an angry little hornet. There's some people playing with their drone. And we're back round at what is definitely the front of the house. I've just noticed all the columns. Yeah, this is the uh, the impressive front bit. And there is the stables again. And that wee drone is uh, way up there. It's a pity that it's all closed off. Oh well, never mind. At least I've shown you the outside of it. So this is the staircase to the grand entrance. And this is the way all the lords and ladies would have arrived if you were a common person or a servant or a plebe, you'd come in via the doors underneath. So up here, you've got all the rich people and down there, you've got all the poor people. And it's quite an interesting building because all the wood was burnt out in the big fire, but all the stonework is still there. So it's, <laughs> it's intact apart from all the wooden bits and the roof. Down there was the library and the drawing room. I'm reading off those two little green signs there. And down there, I wonder if that was like a kitchen or a wash house because it's got like glazed tiles on the wall. Uh, not quite sure what's going on with the statues. I have no idea who that is, but his face does look a little bit uh, weird. And the one on the other side is pretty much the same. They've got sort of strange proportions. They don't look entirely like uh, like an actual person, but there is uh, the other statue on this side. Because if you've got the money to build a house like this and you want a couple of statues, well, why wouldn't you? It is really cool to get inside that building and see how much of it is left and get an idea of what it would have looked like. Unfortunately today we can't, but we will be back, so we'll come back one day when it's open. It really doesn't have a bad side, this building. It's impressive from whichever way you look at it. Another thing to see in the town that doesn't have anything to see. I don't know if you can see that from here, but there's a thing on top of that hill over there as well, and a very impressive looking gate in front of it. I'm going to get closer so you get a better view, so I'm probably just wasting my time because when I get there, I'll do all this again. So these are the Chinese gates, apparently, according to that sign over there. And the thing up on the hill is the Ramsey Monument, which is a monument to the Scottish poet Alan Ramsey. And even from this angle, which is the side of the house, it still looks quite impressive. That's one last wee look at the house. I'm contemplating putting the drone up, but there's an awful lot of people about, so uh, let's see how brave we're feeling. <laughs> So we're heading back to Daisy to go and see what else there is to see in the town that's got nothing to see. One last artistic angle on the tower, if I can see it through the trees. It's a very small car park and Daisy is quite a big van, so hopefully I can get out without hitting anything. And the getting out of the parking situation was not helped by this pair who have uh, boxed me in. Anyway, I'm now off into town to see somewhere that Bex recommended. Okay, so I said there was really not much in Pennycook worth visiting, but uh, Bex then told me about uh, that. Although, annoyingly, a lot of it looks like it is fenced off. Health and safety and all that. 
We like that sign, but we're not so keen on that sign. But this gate at the side is open, so let's go and have a wee look. It does look like quite an interesting old kirkyard though, so let's go and see the bits that we're allowed to see, and uh, not look over there at the really, really interesting bits that you can't get into. To be fair, bits of it are looking quite precarious. That thing has started to tip, and then the... Uh, the obelisk has started to slide off. If that landed on you, that would hurt. Oh, well, that's quite nice. That goes back to what we talk about the great and the good. That is the burial ground of James Brown of Esk Mills. And there's lots of uh, lots of Browns in there and McDougalls and various other hangers on to the family. Next to it is another really cool little private plot with a couple of those picnic table gravestones in them. So let's go and see if we can find out uh, anything about this lot. That one's upside down. <laughs> In fact, they're both facing the opposite direction to the direction you think they'd be facing. Let's go around here and start again. All right, this is still uh, the Browns. This is to the memory of Henrietta Brown, daughter of Andrew Brown, who died in the 2nd day of May 1721. Wow, that's a lot older than I was expecting. I'll have to stop talking so fast when I get excited. We do listen to your comments and we do try, but I do find it quite difficult to slow down when I get going. And we do all the audio as we're walking about, so uh, yeah, must calm down and talk more slowly. Hello, Peter Dow. But over here, beside a tombstone put up by Thomas Lowry and Agnes Smith, his spouse, there is a... Uh, there's a big hole in the fence. Let's go for a wee proper look at the interesting bit. Don't tell anyone I was in here. There's a really cool skull and crossbones, and it was erected by William Irvin. Oh, that's a cool one as well, isn't it? There's lots of really nice gravestones hidden around here. Uh, it's got a little, little face there. That's really interesting, the way the, like, the moisture and the plant life on that just makes it stand out. I mean, the history here is great. If you want to do genealogy, if you've got family from places like this, these graveyards are such a fun place to come for a wee look. As you would have noticed when you saw our video from Whithorn when I went to visit my old great 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 something granddad, old Daniel Hawkins. It is such a nice place. I'm trying not to talk too loud in case there's anybody in that building over there who's going to get upset, but I don't think there is. If you've watched our North Berwick video, you know I've learnt my lesson about going into these really old towers. I bet that is full of very, very happy pigeons who will be delighted to see me and have a big pigeon party by flapping straight into my face. Yeah, not going in there. Everywhere you turn in this graveyard, there are uh, cool things to look at. That building over there is still in reasonable nick. This is the other wee building in the graveyard, and it looks like it is not long for this world. It looks like the oldest part possibly there, and then a newer bit here, and a wee pyramid, and all sorts. That must have been so impressive when it was built. And over here we've got something we need to go and research in memory of James Stark, our beloved son, who lost his life in the Morriswood disaster. Now I know Morriswood is an area of Pennycook, a mining area perhaps. The Morriswood Colliery disaster happened in 1889 when an underground fire cost the life of 63 men and boys. The cause of the fire was never identified, but it did result in the pit being closed down. So as well as the loss of all these lives, there was the economic hardship from the loss of jobs that followed. And this is the names of the people that died. I was going to say the names of the men that died, but uh, W. Meikle, age 12, W. Meikle, age 15. Morriswood is now a big housing estate and there's not much sign of the tragedy that unfolded underground here but there is the memorial. It was put up in 1989 to commemorate the centenary of the disaster. The memory of the 63 men and boys who perished in the fire at Morriswood Pit on the 5th of September 1889 and the wee bit at the bottom in darkness they died to bring light, heat and power to mankind. Stop running, you're not in this video! Okay, I'm going to say something that I say quite a lot, but this is such a nice graveyard and totally unexpected given the rest of Pennycook. This graveyard, as you can see, looks like it's not been used since the early 1900s, but I found out something interesting yesterday. There was a wee boy down south in England that died, and his favourite place was an old graveyard that was shut down in the late 1800s. So if a graveyard is closed down, obviously you can't be buried, unless the king says that you can. So King Charles has given permission for this wee boy to be buried in this uh, very old graveyard, which I think is quite a nice touch. 
I am so glad that I've come down here. I wasn't planning on it because I didn't think it would be particularly interesting, but this graveyard is particularly interesting. And over there might be the war grave. I always like finding these when they've got a sign on the door. It's just, you know, these guys gave their life for the country and it's nice to go and say hello on the way past because they're probably largely forgotten. This is a guy from the First World War, 1920, he died. Uh, R.P. Brown of the Scottish Borderers. Here's a local man, William Wilson, who's a merchant from Pennycook, and then Walter Wilson, who was a mining engineer, and their second son, who died at Colorado Springs, USA, on the 30th of May, 1903. He died a long way from home. And then next one down is John James Wilson, uh, who was a bank agent, not interesting, but author of the Annals of Pennycook, who died at Glasgow. So there's a book called The Annals of Pennycook. I can wholeheartedly recommend you don't bother trying to track it down. I was just talking to myself over there against that wall and just noticed two people walking down the pavement on the other side. <laughs> I still think that I'm absolutely mad. We love these places. We've got hours and hours of extra footage of me walking about graveyards talking to myself. If you'd like to see some of that, check out our other channel. Yes, we've got a second channel. It's called Places for the Past, and it's not going to have a regular update schedule or anything. It's just going to be when we have extra footage of graveyards, we'll put wee episodes together for all you hardcore graveyard fans. And with our wee trip to Pennycook done, we jumped in Daisy and headed west for a night in the van and uh, the following morning a park run. But first we had to stop off so I could do some shopping. It's my turn to do the cooking in the van, so I'm going to go into the big Asda shop behind me and see what I can get that you can make in one pan. I'm just waiting for the little screen on the front of the GoPro to turn off so I can do all this uh, covertly. Do you think anyone will notice? So there's some meat. And there's some vegetables. There you are, meat and vegetables. Nothing if not predictable. Okay, so let's hit the road for the west and let's head towards New Lanark, where we've done a wee check and there is somewhere to park the van. We have made it and we are parked in the New Lanark car park because you're allowed to park here. It's £3 overnight and that is a bargain because you can actually camp properly. <laughs> you don't have to hide and pretend that you're not there. And we're not the only people with this great idea because down there there is a proper camper van. They are probably having quite a good night. We are going to have quite a good night in Daisy because we've got dinner and wine. De Niro is taking up all the floor space, eating his dinner and uh, Bex is over there making ours. Nothing to see. Sorry De Niro, are we uh, getting in your way? So there are the pork steaks that I bought in Asda and there is uh, a selection of vegetables because we are healthy. Uh, and that's wine, so probably not that healthy. If greyhounds are athletes who only eat perfectly balanced diets, why are you picking up bits of crisp off the floor? He's got a balanced diet because he likes mushrooms, peppers and bananas too. But bananas. Yes. Our dog eats bananas. He loves bananas. Have you had enough? De Niro has returned to his bed. <laughs> he's had whatever was on the go while we were cooking and now he's waiting for when the food is ready he'll come back out and start mooching again. He is a world-class moocher. Morning has broken. It's quite a nice place here actually for £3 a night and De Niro and Bex are off for a wee walk whilst I am in charge of making the coffee. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. It's really cold. What a gorgeous day it is. Gorgeous, but a wee bit chilly. Let's not walk into that lamppost. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to do that bit again. What a gorgeous day it is. It's not bad, isn't it? We are at Lanark Moor, which is a sort of traily countryside run, so it should be quite good fun. Uh, very cold and not very fast, but um, yeah. Very sunny. Very sunny. It is extremely cold, but it's also looking extremely nice as the volunteers and the participants arrive. Now, although it is frozen, it does look like it might be a bit muddy, so hopefully I've got the right shoes on. First things first, it's time for the course briefing. We don't need that because we're never at the front. We just follow the people in front of us and there are always lots of people in front of us. Some people take it far too seriously. Uh, that person's brought his horse. The excitement is starting to mount. This is our excited faces. Not that excited. <laughs> And we are off. 
Um, we've had a couple of people asking us about parkrun, and basically what parkrun is, it's a five kilometre run, about three miles, that happens every Saturday, and these are all over the country and they're all over the world. They're in America and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Singapore and Japan and loads of places. It's a, it's a great way to get out your bed on a Saturday morning, so she keeps telling me. The first part of this is on the horse racing course, and coming up on the outside is the Tartan Tartan. But after about a kilometre, you leave the horses behind and head into the woods. And up a big hill. And down a big hill. And then up another big hill. This is what they call undulating. Well done. There you go. And back up to the gate where we rejoin the race course. And five and a bit very cold kilometres later, we are done. But now it's time to put the drone up and have a look round Lanark Loch. a nice place and what a nice day when you go to adopt one greyhound there's a sign that they have up at the adoption center are you uh, not afraid of the greyhound the big big scary greyhound over there no i reckon you're probably a better swimmer than he is 